my name is Bo Ilse. I'm the managing partner of uh, Nokia Growth Partners, which is a global investment fund. Um, and uh, my topic today is mobile monetization 2.0. I will talk a little bit about monetization and mobile, and I'll do a brief introduction also of who is Nokia Growth Partners. And uh, we may have a bit of time for questions in the end, otherwise uh, happy to chat with you uh, afterwards or, or later in the day as well. So first of all, uh, I want to do a little announcement. So uh, we just this morning announced a new investment in a Swedish uh, company called Mag Interactive. Uh, Mag has developed a very, very popular casual social game called Russell. It's, it's a word game uh, which has been tremendously successful and we led a six million dollar investment in the company and uh, it has been announced this morning so that's our latest investment. Um, just very briefly on the background for what we are doing. So we are uh, a global venture investor. We have uh, capital from Nokia. Nokia is our only LP. Um, most people may not know the history, but Nokia has been very committed to venture capital since the late 90s. And over the years, Nokia has committed about $1.5 billion into various venture vehicles, both uh, vehicles that have been more directly managed by Nokia and also uh, other vehicles such as uh, Nokia Growth Partners that is a more indirectly managed fund, which is structured as a VC fund. We have $600 million under management in total, and we announced our latest fund in January of this year of $250 million for global investments. Um, we are uh, investing from one vehicle. Uh, we are active, I would say, in four regions, Western Europe, US, China, and India across the world. We do have a global mandate, but we prefer to invest in the regions there where we have also some uh, some feed on the ground. We typically invest between five and fifteen million dollars uh, uh, in one single company. Having the backing that we have, it's it's no wonder that that we believe every business must be mobile. Uh, this was more unique in 2005 when we started out. Uh, today, more than 50 percent of all venture investments go into. Uh, companies that are somehow active in the mobile space, and we only see that accelerating uh, uh, over the next years. So mobile is one of our core metrics. The other one is obviously financial returns, and being a financially driven investor, uh, uh, that's something that uh, uh, we, uh, we have as a criteria for every investment we do. And obviously then we also build partnerships with, uh, with Nokia. Uh, with the portfolio companies that, uh, that we have as and when uh, we have possibilities to do so. Um, so what I was really here to talk about is, is monetization. And uh, there are two ways to do that on mobile. And, and uh, either people pay you or advertisers pay you. So basically, that's, those, are, those are the two ways you can monetize. And... Um, I found this little Dilbert cartoon, and I think this illustrates quite well what the problem is. And uh, Dilbert says, it might look as if I'm in a dead-end job, but I'm developing an app in my spare time. So his friend on the other side of the table says, here's a lottery ticket. I just doubled your odds of success. And I bought two for myself, so I don't need to make an app, right? So that's, that's really the problem that, that many developers are facing today. Uh, and I don't know if you are aware uh, how many apps are being downloaded this year? Anybody has a guess? Globally, how many apps? Any guesses? 20 billion. 20 billion? Other bits? 40? 100 billion. So 2013, globally, 100 billion apps will be downloaded. Now. Okay, there may be one person downloading the same ad to two different devices, right? But 100 billion apps, right, are being downloaded. So this is massive, right? And uh, developers face two problems. Number one is, how do I get found? So the discovery of an app. Uh, and the second problem is, can I get paid, right? Um, and, and this is uh, more just looking a little bit at, at the opportunities for payments. So. 
this is sort of a generalized framework, but, but uh, I think it has helped us quite well over the years when we have been looking at investment opportunities. So uh, it says on, on the uh, bar here, which is on the left-hand side for you guys, uh, less than 10% are paying users, and, and the rest are price sensitive, right? It doesn't mean that paying users are not price sensitive, but typically they are not sort of whipping out their credit card to pay for something. That percentage is probably declining. As smartphone penetration is increasing, you can imagine it's been pen penetrating uh, deeper and deeper into segments which have lower propensity to pay. So, so the share of people that are actually willing and interested to pay for something on a smartphone is going down. The absolute volume of people, of course, is going up when you look at the absolute uh, 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 market. Now, if we look at, at those that, that are paying, again, there is a variety of methods, and, and uh, uh, it could be operator billing, as was one of the first methods, as, as some of you may remember, based on, on premium SMS, where operators took a nice cut of the, uh, of the transaction, then to app store billing uh, or even card payments, right? Um, looking across these different methods, and again, this is a bit of a generalized framework, but if, if you start on what is the left-hand side here, so for the very small transactions, operator billing is actually a very efficient method, and, and in many markets are still unlocking a lot of potential for, uh, for developers. Um, and, but, of course, the, the, the issue there is that carriers tend to take a larger share of the, of the transaction, so it's anywhere between 25 and 50 percent. Uh, Entity Docomo in Japan has been at the lower end of the spectrum with 8 percent to operators in India that were taking 80 percent out of transactions. So uh, these things are changing over time, of course, and they are coming down as volumes are increasing. But, but traditionally, operator billing has been uh, more expensive than, than other methods of, of payments. Um, then in that scenario, there are other apps that sort of typically take a cut on it, and then the content provider, the developer, gets 35 or 50 percent of the, of the transaction. Moving then to app stores, where everybody understands the model with, with, a, with a Google or, or an, an, an uh, Apple app store and the Microsoft store, so typically there, 30 percent goes to, to the guys running the app store. They also give you distribution, they give you fe uh, uh, featuring, they give you highlights, etc. right? So a lot of people are complaining about this as a cost. At the same time, um, it's also an opportunity to help you for distribution, right? So uh, there are two sides of this coin, right? And, and obviously, if you look at retail, if you look at other uh, means of distributing products and services, 30% is not on one hand, unreasonable. On the other hand, this is a digital good with very little marginal cost. So uh, it's, it sort of seems to have, the market seems to have been stabilizing around that. And then, of course, you can go then to, to credit card payment. There, typically, you have a fixed uh, fee. And that fixed fee, of course, means that if you have a very small transaction, it's not really efficient, number one. Number two, uh, everybody who knows about payments knows that every screen you put in front of a user means that you lose half of the users. So every screen that a user has to go through means that 50% of the users drop off. Right? That's how lazy we are as consumers. Right? There's a reason why Amazon has done one-click payment, uh, because you basically just lose users. Even there is a strong purchase intent, but if you buy something for five, six, seven euros or dollars, if you don't do it at that time, you may not come back. So, so credit card payment is typically suited for larger transactions, but the payment flow is, is traditionally the, the big headache in, in credit card payments. Now, uh, yesterday in, 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 uh, in Financial Times, there was an interview also by uh, Jens Wengemann, the CEO of VUGA, and VUGA is going through actually distributing through uh, uh, chat and messaging networks. So those of you who know about uh, Kakao, Talk, Line, uh, Viber, and these kind of services, they are now successfully starting to distribute games, but they take another 20% of, on top of the App Store. So actually, they are there paying 50% to get distribution. From his point of view, it seems 
that he's willing to pay, pay for that, right, to get more reach through these networks. So, so these balances are changing across different channels. In general, they have been going down over the years, but it seems that that 20, 30 percent level is something that you will end up paying anyway as a, uh, as a developer. Switching to advertising, um, it's a, uh, I don't know if it's more or less complex. It is as difficult as, as payments, I would say. Um, what, what we are looking at is obviously companies that are active in, in mobile and, and across the ad tech space. We have seven ad tech investments in our portfolio and uh, it has been a rich area of investment for us. And if you look at different forecasts here, uh, it's clear that the, the green bar is, is mobile ad tech and that's the one that's slated to grow fastest. And uh, those of you who saw the Facebook uh, quarterly announcements also saw the, the tremendous growth that Facebook have had on, on mobile, uh, their mobile ads. Uh, the, the Twitter IPO obviously is built around uh, a bet that Twitter will be able to build ad formats that fit uh, uh, their 160 character service and, and a lot of that also been driven by mobile and you saw they acquired a company called Mopop uh, which has exactly built solutions for, uh, for helping them uh, getting to mobile advertising. We believe this distinction in three years will be obsolete. We believe that these will converge. There will be a, a, uh, there will be a consolidation in the space today. We see mobile player Mobile only players emerging, we believe over, over three, four years, everybody will have to have a broad digital ad tech offering. Mobile is part of it, online is part of it. So there is a, there is a time now where we can still invest around mobile only players, but we believe that, that uh, this will uh, consolidate at the end of the day because the buyers, the media houses will look for multi-channel as, as they always do where they can consolidate budgets. Um, this is an eye chart done by our friends from Interactive. Uh, this is for ad tech. Uh, it's a very confusing world out there and, and I could show you a similar eye chart for, for payments. Uh, there's a plethora of players out there and, and uh, also as an investor, it is a bit precarious to navigate as the value chain is sliced and diced in many different ways and, and you really have to have very straight thinking in terms of finding where are, your, uh, where are your pockets of value? Um, and just maybe uh, to highlight how we think about it, um, uh, we obviously, being a global investor, see this as a, a global innovation play. We have investments in, in India, in China, in the US and in Europe, in ad tech. These are some of our investments. Uh, what we look for is really people will core technology that is defendable. Um, uh, it's uh, people that are in, in real-time environments, uh, people that are driving new ad unit formats, because in mobile in particular, there are many different ways to do ad units. It's not just a banner ad or it's not just search, right? There are interstitials, there are pop-ups, there are many different formats across mobile platforms. It's, it's a more diverse area than, than, the, uh, than the laptop or the PC screen. Um, Location-based elements are obviously very important. We have invested in wireless in the US, uh, which has a very interesting technology around enabling location-based advertising and location-based ad format. Um, the online to offline world is another part that we believe is gonna grow very strongly. So it's not only thinking about what do I do in digital, but how does that, how can I uh, marry uh, offline advertising with, with digital formats? And we recently invested in two companies. One is Solar Vista in China, which is an outdoor billboard company with a particular technology, which you can integrate with mobile. They have run some very interesting campaigns with uh, Weibo in China, where you, through your messaging, can display actually messages on big billboards and highways in, in real time as you drive past. Um, retail Next is a, a uh, retail technology company, analytics company in the US, and, and they are looking at also new ad formats where based on, on traffic and footfall in stores, they can, they can drive uh, analytics and, and uh, 
and advertising to visitors and stores. So online to offline is another big area for us. In summary, we are a global team. Uh, we are open for business, and uh, we are happy to invest in the space. So that's us. Thank you. I don't know if we have, uh, I don't know who is the timekeeper here. Do we have time for any questions? Yes? Okay. Any, uh, any questions? It's early in the morning. You can't be hangover from the party yet. There's one down there. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on those alternative ad um, formats that you were talking about on mobile. Do you see a standard that's being established that has, been, has not been existent outside of mobile? Yes, yeah, so, so there, is, there, there, is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of experimentation going on. And, and uh, obviously, you know, there are these complete takeovers of the screen where you show video ads. Uh, as you know, the traditional banner format, okay, in my personal view, doesn't really work on mobile because the real estate doesn't lend itself. And, and it's not really attractive, for instance, for a brand advertiser. You need something which is more engaging. Um, one of our portfolio companies, SponsorPay, is, is doing a lot of experimentation with advertising in-app, right, in games in particular. Um, obviously, people are concerned of disturbing the experience in an app or in a game if it's too, uh, if it takes you out completely of the app or the gameplay. So you have the pre-roll, you have the post-roll. But again here, these, and these formats, of course, are then tailored to the platform as well. It, it works in a certain way in Android, it works in a different way in iOS. On the Microsoft platform, it's a third way, right? So. Um, we believe we'll still see a lot of experimentation. People are also experimenting with voice ads. And if you have your ear earphones on, of course, voice ads is a different complement that you could use. Um, so we're just, th this will continue, right? And, and uh, to that question, the big, I mean, the big question on, on the Twitter IPO is also, will they really find an ad format that can drive massive amounts of, of, uh, of uh, revenues to Twitter, right? And, at least some investors uh, believe that they can, but, but so we, we, we continue to invest behind those kind of new formats and people that are, that are working on new formats, so. Uh, thanks. What's your view on the hyperlocation uh, advertisement and mobile, so through navigation applications, for example? I, I don't think we have even started yet, right? Mm. It, it's, uh, it's going to be a core element of, I mean, in five years, it's going to be part of any ad platform in our view. It, it has to be because it, it makes so much sense. Uh, uh, you create much better click-through rates. You create, create much better engagement uh, when you build it in a smart way, right? So we believe it's going to be a, 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 a core part of all ad formats on mobile, absolutely. Okay, I think uh, there is a speaker coming up, so thank you very much and uh, hope to see you around. <laughs>